Joshi. I am, um, uh, oh, it's being recorded. Yes, thank you, Fanula. Um, I am the, uh, this is my last day as the vice president of um, RSVP. Um, so uh, we have Fanula, who is our outgoing president, who uh, will uh, is recording. Wave your hand, Fanula, because uh, the boxes are getting little. Um, I am um, the chair of the Digital Events Committee, and I just want to take a moment and quickly uh, mention some of the other folks on the Digital Events Committee. Uh, let's see, I see Katie Birch. Go ahead and wave your hand. Hi, Katie. Um, I also think I see Ali Hatabchi, um, who's coming from Burgundy, France. Uh, the other members of the committee are Thomas Smith uh, in Amsterdam, Sarif Chatterjee, uh, in New York. Who am I missing, Katie and Ali? Oh, Thomas Hobbs. Thomas Hobbs. Um, and in... Thomas Smith, Andrew Hobbs. <laughs> Andrew Hobbs, sorry, Andrew Hobbs and Thomas Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katie. Um, so uh, they are the other members of the committee and they um, uh, will be led by uh, our incoming vice president, whom I saw somewhere here. Um, there we go, Alison Chapman. So uh, wonderful to have um, Alison here too. So uh, I'm going to, there's nobody else in the chat, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, hello. Um, we have a book launch, and I just want to quickly mention the book launch series has turned out to be one of our really popular series because um, People love hearing about colleagues' books. Uh, so many thanks to Emma Liggins, who is a board member who suggested this idea. Um, and we have very productive RSVPers. So we've had, uh, I think, a couple uh, already. And uh, at the end, I'll tell you about our next digital event, which is what I'm calling a half book launch. And you'll see why. So um, I just want to quickly introduce our two speakers, Teja Varma Pushapati and Mary Shannon. Both of them are um, uh, longtime RSVPers. Both of them have served on the board of RSVP and have given up their time and expertise. Um, Teja is um, associate professor at Shivnandar Institute of Eminence in Delhi. Um, NCR, and somebody uh, asked me what NCR is, National Capital Region. Uh, it's a very, uh, um, you know, big word for uh, the sprawling city that is Delhi. Uh, Mary Shannon is a senior lecturer at Roehampton in London, um, and they are going to speak about their books. Uh, uh, model women of the press and Billy Waters is dancing and what they're going to do is it's a really wonderful they have this wonderful idea for a format where they're actually going to um, have questions for one another so they're going to be in conversation uh, with one another for about um, 30 minutes 35 minutes and then we'll open the floor for what I hope and they hope will be a discussion so um, does that sound right Mary and Theja okay take it away Absolutely. Thank you, Priti. Um, Thanks for hosting. Thanks for inviting us. And thanks to everyone for, for coming along. Uh, we're both absolutely thrilled to be part of this event and part of this series. Um, and I must say, my participation is all thanks to Teja, who uh, was invited to do a book launch by Priti and very kindly said, I know, I'd like to partner up with Mary, um, which was wonderful. So thank you, Teja. Uh, Teja and I were on the same panel at the RSVB conference in Carl in Normandy, which was um, such fun, <laughs> such fun. Um, and uh, yeah, as soon as I met Teja, I thought, this is somebody I need to know better. Um, not only is she a brilliant mind, uh, she is a good laugh. So um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And we're delighted to reprise this panel now that our books are out. Uh, so we have four questions and we're going to alternate and I will begin by asking Deja. Um, a simple starting question, really. What did you aim to achieve on this project when you began it and as it came to fruition? Thank you so much. And uh, I just wanted to start by thanking Preeti and the RSVP Digital Committee for this absolutely wonderful opportunity to present my book alongside Mary's absolutely brilliant new work. Um, 
And also this is particularly special to me because I think it's the only opportunity I'll ever get to present my work in a community of scholars from Delhi and Oxford, the two places where this book was written, um, as well as the entire global RSVP community, which was, uh, to use a phrase that is very familiar to all of you, the main intended readership for this book. So it's really, thank you. And um, Mary, about, uh, you know, this, why, what was the main aim about, of, um, uh, that I set out to do when I started this, it was really to tell the story of how some Victorian women writers uh, successfully stormed the male bastions of serious social and political journalism. And uh, I wanted to place this firmly within the wider histories of the professionalization of authorship and journalism, uh, the widening sphere of female professions and debates around female work, and also like the developing roles and genres of social and political writing within 19th century media. So in that sense, part of media histories. And uh, wanted to do this by tracking the, their actual working lives as journalists. So what were they telling their editors and readers? How were they convincing them? How did Harriet Ward, an army wife uh, in South Africa, convince an editor to let her cover war for an armed services journal? You know, how, how did she pull this off? Uh, so really, and how did they present themselves as model professionals? So that was... Yeah, that was sort of the main aim. And uh, yeah, and I'd like to hear about your work and what really you set out to do and what were the chief sort of uh, aims that you had in mind when you wrote this. Well, I'm going to just briefly share a slide um, because it'll help me answer your question, Teja. So bear with me while I do that. I hope everyone can see this. Um, my... Um, was Mary, was Mary, do you yeah. want to put it on play? Because it's right now not on play yet. Oh, thank you. I attempted to and it didn't do it. There we go. Um, I was, yeah, twofold aim. First of all, to tell the story of Billy Waters, who was a 19th century Regency busker in London. Um, he was originally born in New York in the late 18th century, so he was African-American uh, by birth, if I can use that slightly anachronistic term. Um, and he became a busker after he lost a leg in an accident at sea and then became famous. Uh, his image circulated through periodicals, serial fiction, and uh, he, he turns up in stage plays and caricatures. Um, and I first encountered him in periodicals and in images and thought, who is this person? What were they doing in Regency London? And what was what was what was his life story? So it was it was about giving visibility to this overlooked figure from history. Um, but I also wanted to re-examine race and class and the representation of those things in early 19th century periodicals. Uh, I had a problem. There was an empty archive. So um, one of my aims was thinking through the problem of what you do when there are hardly any facts and records about someone, but an awful lot of stories and mythology. Um, and uh, as I'll say in a bit, you know, periodicals played a big role in spreading the myths about Billy Waters as well as the facts. Um, what do you do when somebody's story and fame arise from their own performances? Here's a picture of Billy Waters performing in, in London, um, but also from, from kind of made up ideas of, of what uh, this man was or what he might mean. Um, the story spread through periodicals in a way that I began to think of as, as meme-like. So I wanted to think about the ways in which popular characters like Waters might be said to to become a kind of 19th century meme, uh, mm -hmm. to use our, an internet analogy, um, to spread virally, to sort of shift and adapt and change as they spread, and how periodicals facilitated this to help create uh, a transatlantic popular culture, um, a popular meme culture in the early 19th century. So I was really interested in teasing out the implications of this and periodicals' role in this, uh, for constructions of race and class from 1800-ish to about 
So uh, I think for both of us, um, mm -hmm. we're both interested in the people and the mm -hmm. methodological questions about periodicals themselves, yeah. I think. Yeah, is very yeah. Uh, yeah, and I was wondering, Mary, if you could share what was the most challenging or an interesting part of the project for you as you were setting it? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think uh, two things really. We we spoke about this, didn't we? That that um, part of what we're both doing is is seeing what has gone on scene for so long. Um, mm -hmm. So in my case, paying attention to a person whose life has been overlooked has been has been forgotten by history. Um, but who is a window into a bigger story about the importance of black performers in popular culture, about the function of periodicals in popular culture, um, and, and about the ways in which street people were seen and perceived and um, turned into imaginary characters uh, in, in all kinds of different media, not least in periodicals. Um, this gave me a real challenge because I had to think through my own positionality as an author. So this is, uh, there are many, many ways in which I'm nothing like Billy Waters. Um, I'm not black, I'm not disabled, I'm not living in the 19th century. Um, so I had to think about uh, how I, how I could tell his story in a way that felt ethically right and morally responsible. Um, and uh, the way the way I did that was thinking about um, trying to look with Waters rather than at him, trying to uh, understand the influences which he was uh, using in his own performances and in his own self-representation rather than thinking of him to in the way the 19th century did, which was very much um, an observed mm -hmm. subject, an exoticized ideal, uh, the king of the beggars, the flamboyant carnivalesque imaginary character. Mm -hmm. um, what about you, Teja? What was the most challenging or the most interesting part of, of your project, would you say? Yeah, you know, it's something that I think we're all, we all grapple with, I think, as scholars of periodicals and newspapers, which is particularly if you're studying models of authorship, uh, mm -hmm. then we talk about reading them and examining them in situ. Uh, and I, so the project uh, required that each of these models be consistently examined in situ. Now, this meant examining them across a very wide range of media formats and paying very close attention to questions of form, rhythm, geographical location, and how that actually editorial styles, et cetera, you know, how does that then shape what can be said and how it can be said? Uh, so what it looked like in the actual work was, uh, so for example, if one wants to look at how uh, a feminist journal enables certain forms of writing, I decided then to look at the full run of the English Women's Journal, which, you know, at some sense, you know, sort of also makes a certain demand of like stamina for you know, six years over and over and over again, you know, because I read Laurel Brake's absolutely wonderful article about structural networks, you know, because I track the personal and professional networks. But if you have to study the structure of a journal formally, uh, then you're looking at both what is consistent, but also what is changing. Uh, and the only way to sort of track that is to do the full run. Um, and also to look at, for example, when someone like Eliza Meteard moves from something like Douglas Gerald Schilling magazine to Howard's. Now, they share certain commitments politically, but in terms of form, they are hugely different. And when one goes to the archives, one recognizes just how much he struggled to get used to the rhythm of Howard's and the specific demands of Howard's. So how did she then do that? How did Pob, for example, manage to fit this article on women's uh, writing into what was called a Macmillan's worthy piece. So it's very true. What you said about the archives is also so true, right? Because sometimes like the letter that Paul wrote to her editor, I found one fragment of it in a vast file in the Bodleian. It was just a fragment. But because it referred to this particular article, 
and he's saying things like this is Macmillan worthy and I was like wow what is so Macmillan worthy about this and so you go back to Macmillan's and see what they considered Macmillan worthy and uh, and then see what is it that she's fitting it to um, you know and also to yeah so the to sort of work with each of these models in situ to work out what did war correspondence look like in an armed service colonial, trans-colonial monthly. It looks very different from what it looks like in newspapers. And the only way to understand is go back to the periodical. So, yeah. Um, and that's a brilliant place actually to segue into to what I want to ask you next, which is about conceptual methodology and about periodicals. Um, so, so yeah, what was what was your conceptual methodology, and and how did you approach periodicals and newspapers as sources? Yes, yeah, so I think one of the main sort of engines of the project is sort of this commitment to look at them not as an archive of con content, but to look at them as, you know. A, a, to really draw from a very influential and growing line of excellent scholarship that looks at the 19th century press and has looked uh, at it as, um, you know, the Bordeauxian concept of the literary field, uh, a literary field which then has its own personnel, formats, locations, markets, readership, etc. Uh, but to then, now if you apply this to investigations of authorship then, it will mean really recognizing the critical measure of authorial agency that is available in that specific field, in specific instances. Uh, and sometimes actually even, uh, so, you know, Finella, others who've used this wonderfully, uh, the, the notion of the Bordeauxian literary field, but also actually scholars like Linda Peterson, because I take a lot from her development of notions of models, which she does in Becoming a Woman of Letters, uh, which is about professional models. How did they come into being? Um, and I also took from uh, Claire Petit's recent work on uh, serial forms was it really came like a rescue sort of work because it, I was grappling with questions of really how does one think of topicality that is not set to daily rhythms. And uh, Claire Petit had this whole formulation of topicality's oblique relation to news that really helped me along with Catherine Waters' published work on the special correspondent that, that sort of really sort of rescued me, gave me something to work with. Um, and notions of what does serialization look like outside? Uh, so how, what does it mean to serialize reportage? Uh, reportage, which is not set to the daily newspaper circle. So what does serializing war mean? Uh, what does war by the month mean? It means something very different from 24 hour news cycle. Right? And uh, particularly with the Armed Services Monthly, the uh, United Service Magazine, which I have a huge section on. Uh, I worked with, uh, you know, Sukanya Banerjee's uh, theoretical formulation of the Trans-Imperial, because that's really what this war reportage was doing. Uh, putting the con the colony and colonial events in um, a relationship of contiguity and interconstitutedness with the metropole back home. Um, and then finally, really all the work around signature, Alexis Easley and so many other scholars, when I was sort of thinking with all of those tools that I could use uh, to sort of make these fine distinctions between work that is signed, work that is unsigned, but is gendered feminine, um, pseudonyms, which were open, pseudonyms which were not so it's not always covered pseudonyms which covers with slip you know covers with just slip people suddenly become visible and uh, you know uh, pseudonyms which function as aliases which is a very different category uh, than just sort of uh, opaque pseudonyms so yeah sorry so this was the white sort of theoretical na critical neighborhood <laughs> but, I like uh, that. <laughs> Critical neighborhood. I really like that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so actually, Mary, I was very interested in, and I was looking at your work. And so what work, because there's a certain kind of demand, I think, and particularly difficult if you're looking at traces that are not fully fleshed out in the archive. So I was really interested in the methodological tools that you were sort of going into this project. Yeah, well, it was actually um, something Caroline Bressy said at an RSVP digital events uh probably about four years ago now which which gave me the starting point for how to actually do this project i'd had it in mind for a long time but couldn't quite work out 
how was I going to marry up the story of someone's life, my interest in periodical networks and periodicals as a network? Um, how could I put these two things together? How did they fit? And then uh, Caroline Bressy said something, um, she, was, she was talking about the uh, gaps and absences in periodicals that how that um, finding unfiltered voices of marginalized people is um, a, a challenge and an absence in so many 19th century periodicals and and that the way to to work with this and work through this is by taking an interdisciplinary approach and suddenly I thought ah okay so actually um, the way to do this is to put periodical studies in dialogue with uh, approaches from disability history, approaches from critical race theory, um, but also and also uh, interdisciplinary work on visual culture, um, not just so so linking up the illustrations in periodicals with caricature, with theatre, with performance, with the stage. Um, and recognizing the intertextuality of the text that I was working with and uh, seeing Waters as a kind of a, a story to tell in his own right and a case study for um, the interaction of different kinds of media uh, that, that helped, that reinforced the periodical networks that I was interested in. Um, so, so first off, I, I guess, Sort of interdisciplinarity was was really important. Um, then thinking about this idea of characters, so Billy Waters was both a, a, a real historical, living, breathing person, and a character with a capital C, an imagined idea, a representation of what um, a black performer might be, a street performer might be, a disabled man might be. Um, in the Regency period. Uh, and so I was interested in the way these characters became meme-like, um, traveled across periodicals and traveled across different, different media uh, within what I came to think of as a network of popular culture. So as, as well as in the disciplinary approach, as well as thinking about disability history, as well as thinking about critical race theory, I was also interested in network studies. I'm always interested in network studies. Um, so yes, uh, Joanne's work on networks um, and uh, uh, you know the, the going back to actor act network theory, um, which is something I've been interested in for ages, uh, and thinking about um, uh, how how the kind of analogies we reach for for the internet today actually can they track backwards and have a history. Um, so. Uh, what became clear by by looking at this topic through a disability history lens was the ways in which becoming meme-like, um, having your image taken from you and circulated beyond in ways far beyond your control, as happened to Billy Waters, for somebody who was as vulnerable as Billy Waters and um, many of the other uh, street people of of London. This was a, a, a ultimately a, a destructive experience. Um, and that uh, this, the way popular culture was constituted is it, it, it gave people their 15 minutes of fame. Um, it fed off uh, their distinctive characters. It fed off the way they presented themselves. Um, but then it, it destroyed them. Waters isn't the only example of this, but he's a particularly um, a particularly potent example. Uh, he became famous because of his many representations, um, but ultimately uh, ends up in a workhouse in extreme poverty and sees none of the money that a whole host of playwrights, artists, theatre managers, um, memorabilia sellers make out of him. Um, and so, yeah, I think for me, it was that interdisciplinary approach which enabled me to to bring together the, the, so many of the different aspects of Walter's story and to show the ways in which mm -hmm. his life 
can help us rethink our approaches to disability history and to um, histories of race and to uh, histories of of periodicals in, in this early 19th century period. Oh, that's, that's just really brilliant. Uh, I was also thinking, Mary, of like how this might have shaped uh, how you used archives. How did you engage with archives? What was your sense of mm. that? That was, that was the real joy of this project and also yet another challenge. Uh, I am at my happiest messing around in a dusty archive. Um, I went to, I used the Bodleian, I used, uh, spent a happy fellowship period at the Houghton in Harvard. Um, and then I used a whole host of archives in and around London. So the National Maritime Museum for Waters Naval Past, uh, the National Archives, which has um, some of the few remaining records documentary evidence of his existence. Uh, I used British Museum, um, I used Camden Local History Archives, London Metropolitan Archives, anything and anywhere where I could find some trace of, of his existence, but also traces of people whose lives could be considered similar to Waters, a way of find, building up a, a picture by contextualizing with other lives. That being said, of course, again and again, just like Caroline Bressy warned me um, in her talk all those years ago, uh, there are so many gaps and silences in the archives. If, you, if you're looking for somebody who is, was poor, disabled and or non-white, you are going to have problems. Um, that is, of course, a function of deliberate erasure as well as uh, choices of collection. So not only did I have to do the detective work, but I needed a theoretical framework for, for dealing with those gaps. Um, and what I found most helpful actually was Sergio Hartman's uh, concept of critical fabulation, because there she, she argues for the role of imagination, of critically informed research guided imagination in filling in where we don't have hard evidence. And that enabled me, that gave me license, I felt, to bring the techniques of the novelist to the problem of biography. And it also enabled me to, to make those linkages between um, what I was seeing in the periodicals and what I was seeing in other kinds of material. Um, and so ultimately then how I decided to structure the project was around Waters own costume. Um, going back to what I said about how I wanted to look with Waters rather than look at him. I didn't want to put his life against the arguments I was making about periodicals in a way that sort of used him to tell a story which is actually over here. I wanted his story to mm. to um, take center stage, I can use that mm. performance metaphor. Um, and the way, but I also wanted to make this bigger argument about uh, a, a meme like popular culture. So what I did was I looked at the images of Waters and well, well actually those images are the closest we have to water biography. He didn't leave papers, he didn't leave diaries, we barely have any records of the key dates of his life. What he did leave was his costume. And even though it was represented by somebody else, what about if we ask the questions, well, why that feathered hat? Why that sailor jacket? Why a fiddle? What could the wooden leg have meant to him? And then you can start to see, I argue, uh, the evidence of um, the multiple communities and cultures uh, American, Afro-Caribbean, um, British, naval, maritime that, that Waters was a part of and was bringing together in his performance and made it so striking and original and creative. Uh, and in doing that, that actually, it didn't really take me away from what I wanted to mm. think about, from thinking about how memes spread throughout periodicals. Um, it actually gave me a way of doing that. and showed me 
I, well, I would like to suggest shows that Waters knew full well what he was doing. He knew that he was operating in a meme culture. He knew the way to grab attention was to create a striking image that people are going to take and use and reproduce. This is a savvy businessman. And uh, uh, that, in the end, the big problem, the gaps in the archive, I realized, well, I didn't really need to find a creative way of telling Water's story and filling in those gaps because he'd actually already done that back in the 1820s. He'd already found the way. I just needed to show what it was he'd already done. Um, and what about you? Because one of the big commonalities between our two projects is this interest in archives. So, so same to you. How did you use archives and what did you learn? So extensively, actually, uh, one of the, the, the main parts of this project was always going to be in the archives because uh, everything, really, when one is reconstructing the working lives of these journalists, and figuring out just the strategies that they used, uh, I relied heavily on archives. So there's really extensive use of them. So I felt very grateful uh, to archivists who preserved these files, uh, you know, at sometimes great length, uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, they, they just don't, you have to work with what you have. And I, that I think we have in common. What I was really struck by was also the archive, the, the presence in the archive was in some sense, in my case, uh, a direct result of the, some of the victories, uh, hard won victories that the story, that this book actually traces. So the English Women's Journal, uh, the founders of the English Women's Journal went on to, found uh, Girton College, Cambridge. So Girton College, Cambridge has extensive archival material on, uh, you know, the English Women's Journal. So, um, which also allowed me looking through it, it's hundreds of pages and looking through it, actually, I, I was quite startled because what I found was that, you know, how we tend to think of usually the way in which feminist journalism is, you know, thought of as having no market interest, you know, it's high-minded, but doesn't really think of finances, right? But if you actually look at the letters, uh, they thought very carefully about the market. Uh, they had to, otherwise they would never, the, the voice would never reach a wider audience. They had to think. And uh, it was actually a huge amount of discussion about what was commercially sound, what was unsound, how many, when were subscriptions rising, when were they falling, by how much? Uh, how are they going to fund this? Where are additional funds going to come? At what point did they float more shares? They had a joint stock model of investment you know, to share risk and investment. Um, so there was that part. And then there was uh, Howard's Houghton Library, which we seem to have in common along with the body, uh, which had hundreds of letters uh, between uh, Metiard and uh, Mary Howard. Uh, but most of these letters were undated, you know, so I was just sitting with these reams and reams of letters and then found myself actually going back to the published periodical for clues or dating. So for example, if they were discussing an article that was going to come out in February and sending Christmas greetings, and I would go back and check the publication date. So obviously then it's the Christmas of that year, you know, and they were, uh, and it only ran for a limited period of time in Howard. So you can actually go back to the periodicals to date the archive, archival material, to have some sense of the date of that. Um, and then there was this absolute serendipitous discovery via an excellent, one of the only scholars to really earlier worked on uh, Harriet Ward, which was Valdi Lecher um, uh, in South Africa. And uh, she did her thesis in 1996. And... Uh, in her thesis, which is unpublished, but it's excellent, one of the earliest real studies of Harriet Ward, um, was a reference to the Brenthurst Library in Johannesburg, which she said had, she cited about two or three letters. And then I, you know, when one looks at the Brenthurst archive, it's only about seven letters. But what letters of gold they were. I mean, they gave me everything. You know, there was this one letter which she told me, you know, where was she, how was she convincing the editor, a letter to ed a letter to a letter to Colburn. You know, Colburn, anyone's worked with Colburn knows that it's exceptionally hard to find letters to Colburn because they all went up in the blitz, I believe. You know. So uh and I was like, wow, there's a letter to Colburn in Johannesburg. <laughs> and it sort of said, you know, what was she reading? That led me to looking at uh, the fact that the Illustrated London News was being read in the Cape Colony 
it was being read in the Eastern Cape. She compares her reportage to what is happening in the ILN. She frames her subjects according to that and creates lurid afterlives for stories that were breaking out in uh, ILN. You know, so there's a certain way in which what does it mean to report across a time lag of several months in a colony, you know, the outpost sort of location. Uh, and the fact that these uh, metropolitan periodicals were actually being shipped to the colonies. So I also examine not only writing from an outpost of empire, but what does it mean to read the island three months later? What does it mean? And the fact that she, in, on her desk, she was reading the island alongside Cape Colonial newspapers, you know, uh, settler newspapers. Um, and she talks about their issues of race, uh, which is in your face. It's, it's, it's racist reportage. Uh, but also how racial categories got constituted, you know. What are the phobias that went into the creation of what, you know, later we understand this, these kind of categories. And the other kind of archive, which I actually, at one point, I suppose if I had worked in the, I don't know, 30 years before, I would have had to do this in the archive. And also, I think I would have never found this material if I had worked in the physical archive, which was, you know, there was this moment in the project, uh, fairly late, actually, uh, where I was really struggling with the sense of Harriet Martineau's, you know, Irish correspondence, because there was one reference in her autobiography to some Irish priests had guessed me, uh, had sort of made out that I was the writer by guess. And I was like, by guess, like, what, what? and it sort of rankled in my head for a while. And uh, the British newspaper archives actually digitized some, uh, you know, huge words of Irish provincial newspapers. So then I did a search there and found out exactly who guessed her out. And then it was, it was, it changed what I thought of her. So it actually wasn't, on paper it's anonymous, but everybody knew who, who was writing. The Irish papers actually sent out their own correspondence as a counter to Harriet Martin. So she's she's getting questioned, she's getting challenged. Uh, you know, anonymity in print doesn't necessarily mean, particularly for a celebrity writer, you couldn't go very far without getting recognized. So yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, yeah, isn't it? How archive work can completely change the way you structure a project. Or, yes. I mean, for me, it, it, my trip to the Houghton completely changed the end of the book. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear that it, it happened for you as well. Yes. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on time, and I think we'd probably yes. better end our yeah. conversation, although I could talk to you for hours about your project. <laughs> I mean, it's so good. Um, yeah. But but we should leave some time for everybody to to chip in with thoughts or or ideas or questions. Um, I wondered actually if while people are thinking of their questions, you might want to show your slide with the the women who are in your yes. project. Oh, thank you. Yeah, just I while people of, um... think of what they want to ask. But I'll let Pretty um, moderate. Yes, if you want to... sorry. Uh, can you? See oh, that? sorry. Did I? Yeah, yeah. No, they they do. We can see it. Yeah. Do so you want to see? Made... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so just made the slide because uh, I, sort of working with this project also meant working with celebrity women writers and absolutely neglected, unknown, but remarkably innovative and important to the history of 19th century print media. Uh, so writers who were completely unknown. So in fact, when I was trying to do this um, slide, uh, there's, you know, from the left, you know, there's Bessie Rayner Parks, Barbara Bodichon, Eliza Matyard. And Harriet Ward was absolutely pioneering, uh, first known female war correspondent. There's no no photograph, uh, no no portrait of her that is available. So I just left her as that. So it, it meant working with, you know, across uh, writers who registered very differently in our history, you know, the portrait. And I'm trying to change that, I think. And I think the project sort of grapples with that question. Uh, yeah, so I just stopped sharing that. Thank you both uh, for that really wonderful. And I love the format where you're talking to one another. And so many rich things came out. I mean, so many things about both your books and about methodology and about periodical studies. So um, I'm going to moderate now. Um, the The format will be pretty uh, simple. Uh, raise your electronic hand or your real hand. I think if you have uh, the updated Zoom, if you raise your real hand your electronic hand will come up mine is not doing oh there we see it will come up automatically i'm actually going to lower my hand um 
because I don't, uh, I don't know how to lower my hand. I'll figure out how to do, there we go. Uh, so go ahead and raise your hand. You, you can also um, use the chat box, uh, although I think it's always lovely to hear from people, to see from people. So if you feel comfortable turning on your camera and voicing your question yourself, that will be great. Uh, if you don't, if you use the chat box, I'll just um, uh, read your question. So it is actually in the recording. Um, and we all have a hand up. We have Urmila who has a question. So go for it, Urmila. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to uh, open my camera. Uh, it's too late in uh, India to <laughs> open my camera. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm Teja's colleague and a friend. And uh, but I'm very thrilled uh, to to hear this uh, conversation between Mary and Teja. And I have short questions to both of them. Uh, one. Uh, because I'm really, really excited by the kinds of possibilities of the questions that have come, but I really want to ask short questions. Please take them as you would like, uh, Mary and uh, Teja both. Uh, first to uh, Mary, I see the uh, the fiddle. I, I see your protagonist with a fiddle in the uh, in the in the picture that you showed. Uh, so I wanted to know how do you decipher the sound element in mm -hmm. in uh, you know, archive. Uh, are there any methodological tools that you use to uh, find sound? Uh, that's my particular interest. And so I'd, I'd like to learn from you. And also to kind of characterize popular culture against the kind of uh, later day formulations of popular culture, for example, by uh, Stuart Hall. So that's for Mary. And uh, to Teja, the question is, how would how would you like to comment on the idea of public sphere? I am a little unsure of this question. There are lots of critiques of public sphere, but you are talking about a kind of intervention in the way in which uh, women are thinking about state policy war in wartime. So do you have anything to kind of share about the idea of public sphere? Thank you. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Omar, for your questions. Uh, I'll, I'll go first just because you mentioned my name first. No other reason. Um, thank you. Yes. Uh, how do you find sound? How do you find sound in the archive? Uh, that was definitely a question that I was asking myself when I was doing this project. Um, I came at it recognizing that my sources were. My contemporary sources were visual, but my present day sources were audible. So um, I had to put together 19th century visual representation with 21st century folk performance practice and see what that did. Uh, I looked for histories of dance, histories of music, histories of performance. Um, and I was particularly interested in uh sailor I mean, maritime performance and in um african american music and music rhythms so for billy waters in particular what you can get from the images is the way he's holding that fiddle um the way the, the position on his body turns it from a violin into a fiddle uh he holds it low on his shoulder and he holds it in front of him so his arm is kind of like that, <laughs> rather than out like that, <laughs> like a violinist. Um, and uh, folk musicians tell me that that um, that's about speed and control, so you can play jigs much easier. Uh, and then you also you don't have music, so you're not you're not trying to hold it. So you can look at your music stand over here. You're actually looking down the the the, the sort of leg of it, so you can see what you're doing because you're 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 not, you're not sight reading. You're 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 playing from you're playing by eye. Um, so that or that tells us the way he holds the fiddle. You can compare that then with how people hold the fiddle today, and then that starts to give you a sense of sound um, and the possibilities of sound. And you can see in the images as well where he holds the bow and where his fingers sit on the strings, which again gives you a sense. Um, it's going to be something that sounds a little bit Irish, a little bit American uh, bluegrass, a little bit um, maritime hornpipe, 
and a little bit pinkster Afro-Caribbean uh, rhythm. Um, so you can start to get a sense of how, of what made Waters as a performer stand out on the London streets. Um, so I would say in terms of thinking of a broader methodology, because obviously Waters is just one example, finding sound in the archive is about where you can using visual sources and contemporary sounds and seeing if you can piece those bits of the puzzle together. Uh, if you've got accounts of how somebody played, even better. But of course, that is then filtered through language and representation. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful, but I'm very happy to talk more. Um, this is absolutely wonderful. I mean, wonderful the, the way you are reading music or hearing music in the visual. And that's something that really interests me. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and in terms of popular culture, just very briefly, I thought about in the book popular culture as a network. So um, I moved away from the terms mass culture or mainstream because I found those far less helpful. There's a very long answer to that, but um, there's a question for Teja. So I will stop. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Urmila. That's such a fantastic question. And uh, I was just thinking of, um, I was sort of drawing on, I mean, in that set, sort of drawing on two things, I, addressing the question via that. One is, uh, this been, the book sort of benefits and is hugely in, indebted to uh, a huge, a long line of feminist scholarship that rethinks the notion of what is the I mean, this we are familiar with, uh, both, of course, um, the public sphere, but also what is politics. So I, I thought of, you know, the, to, to conceptualize politics outside of parliamentary agendas, which was at, at one time very dominant, and to think of print and the periodical and newspaper press as part of that. But also to answer this more, like, um, granularly, in terms of the public sphere, um, how do they engage in discussions of public policy was very important. Like how were they gaining knowledge? Sometimes it was even something like statistical knowledge, which, so how were they gaining that? What were they reading? So the book sort of goes into how, for example, did some writers become, uh, were just, were able to participate in debates on political economy, which is hugely influential in public policy discussions of the day. Um, particularly in reference to, and so there was that, there was um, legal, like legislative change. How were they arguing for legislative change? Uh, so there were there were one set of categories in relation to public sphere, which had to do with knowledge, uh, authority. Uh, how do you gain the authority to hold forth in the public sphere in print on this? But I was also wanted to sort of uh, ask, answer to this other part of this question, I think, which is issues of voice. Uh, because for a lot of these uh, women to participate in public also meant opening themselves out to a lot of ridicule. Uh, so there's also very interesting ways in which they once ridiculed and fight back. Uh, so there's a section called holding their own in holding our own, which I take from the feminist journalist that I study, where they actually had to strategize about how were they going to answer these attacks. Um, and I was also very interested in questions of humor uh, I was really struck that they were fantastic at humor and uh, uh, what does it mean to crack a feminist joke in 19th century, in, the, in a 19th century periodical? And uh, Cobb actually, that was the USP of the main article that gave her, you know, real place in Frazier's, uh, uh, sorry, Macmillan's, uh, which was that she was able to turn the, there's this wonderful article where she refers to male uh, uh, attackers of women as dancing like dogs barking so you know it's just really shocking that that image can be used in public but uh, it's actually overturning an earlier image of women speaking in public as dogs walking on their hind legs uh, Sammy Johnson so on and so forth so I look at what images are they working with and what are they inverting what does it mean to laugh crack a joke like this in the public sphere but yeah but sorry it's not a very well articulated response but it's just some of the things that came to mind but thank you that's a really, really interesting question. Thank you both for uh, your great answers. Uh, makes me think, and I'll connect with both of you. Uh, Deja sooner than Mary, but yeah. Thank you, Urmila. 
Um, we have time for other questions, uh, comments. Um, while people are thinking, I'll say two things. One that I um, neglected to say at the start, but both Theja and Mary's projects have been supported by RSVP. Theja uh, had a Kern Award. Mary had a Peterson Award. Uh, Theja, you mentioned Linda Peterson is one of your um, uh, uh, critical neighborhoods, I think is the term you use. Um, and I just also want to say that uh, the Peterson Award is just opening um, on Sunday, I think. So um, yeah, do look out for that. While people might be thinking, I don't see any hands up. I actually want to ask, um, I loved that. I have so many questions, but um, actually, you know what? Sally has a question. So I'm, a, I'm going to go silent and I'm going to invite Sally to ask her questions because I can, uh, you've, heard, you've heard my voice. So go ahead, Sally. Sally, you're on mute. Sorry. Thank you both. Absolutely fantastic presentations and wonderful discussion between the two of you. Um, a, a question for Tasia. Um, so it, it, it's something, obviously, we have discussed, but the, the whole issue of a female being a war correspondent and Harriet Ward's you know, peculiar position of being sort of a, a, out of, uh, in Africa and yet designating herself almost as a a uh, female war correspondent, and I, I really like the way you were, you were thinking about the the temporality of it and what it means to be a, a war correspondent if you're a, only so filing monthly. Um, but I was pondering on have you unearthed further female war correspondents who came after Harriet Ward, or is she standing sort of more or less alone for for quite some time before she's joined by others? Thank you so much, Sally. That's uh, also like for those of you who don't know, Sally was my PhD supervisor and she's seen this project through all of its phases. So it's really fantastic to have this from you, Sally. Uh, so in terms of the other writers that I discovered along the same lines as Harriet Ward, uh, she was, there was one more writer uh, who was writing in the United Service magazine uh, who was called Georgina Munro. But uh, Mandro actually begins to write about South Africa after she leaves that region. So it's actually really interesting. And she's writing in other modes. So, it's, so which makes me think that this peculiar position that Harriet Ward has, and it is peculiar that she's pretty much standing alone, has to also do with the coincidence of the, the, the coincidental outbreak of war at the same time that she's there because Manra was writing between two of the serial wars. Uh, so the war just, I, I guess she would have written if she had been there at the time, um, but uh, she she didn't. And uh, I did look for, uh, I did look for uh, other instances. I was thinking of the uh, 1857 uh, War of Independence here, mutiny, uh, but, um, uh, I didn't find any female uh, reporters on that or on other, but it would be interesting to see if others, maybe much later, but this is something that I would be very interested in seeing further if they were further down the line, maybe into the 70s or 80s. But as of now, I, it, she did sort of stand out uh, as the only one doing that at that time. And once she leaves South Africa, the, the immediate years after that in the USM, there was no one. Uh, that didn't, but but again, it, it's also really hard to tell because it would mean actually reading all of the journal material because it could be that there was someone who didn't sign it, but was still using the female persona. But uh, yeah, so sorry, so that was the main. Um, yeah, I didn't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Kathy, do you want to? You have your hand up. Yes, thanks. Brilliant talks, both of you. But I, I just wanted to follow on from that question from Sally uh, Fataja. I, I mean, I was struck. It was very interesting what you were saying about sort of different temporalities and seriality and the fact that um, Harriet Ward is reporting news, but in a monthly format. So really, I guess what what was coming through to me and what you were saying is that 
eyewitnessing actually trumps immediacy of you know the the time factor if what she's reporting in in that periodical um can at least can be seen to be equally important to things coming back through the illustrated london news and i just wondered whether you want to comment on that idea that it's eyewitnessing that is the key to authenticity rather than speed Thank you, Kathy. This is just such a great question. And uh, so there were two, and I was really, and um, thank you so much. I mean, Kathy was my examiner and sort of I really worked with her comments when I was trying to work this out for myself and grapple with this question of what is the news value of Harriet Ward's reportage. So there were two things. Uh, one was that it actually needs exactly what you're saying, eyewitness um, quality. It also has uh, a certain immersive quality, uh, but, uh, and it also has the other sort of well-known features of war correspondence, such as trying to replicate an immediacy, um, which is not that of news value necessarily, but there is a certain emphasis on trying to recreate the sounds of war, bullets, you know, sort of what is being shelled or bullets being shot or, so there's a lot of sound in Harry Ford's reportage. And that really stands out because it's not, so there is that immediacy. And there's also the sense that the daily news reportage, there's a certain kind of competitive relation that she has with that. Um, because she knows that people would know, for example, that war broke out on such and such a day. There's no news value to that. But there is a news value to her report in terms of the details that she's adding to that. Uh, so there's a very clear sense that I will give you a, not only a more detailed account, so the what we would otherwise think of as descriptive details, because they're part of this um, conveying what um, Mary Favreit has this wonderful formulation of war correspondence, as sort of, you know, this strange kind of um, genre, the condition of which is a certain epistemological and affective gap. So the gap has to be there. And yet the entire effort is to try and close that gap, to convey through information, through details, what it means to be at the site of war. Uh, so that is very much there uh, in terms of what she's conveying. She's filling in the gap, so to speak, in the daily news coverage. And uh, the third was that there's also this idea that because of the 24 hour news cycle being so rapid and uh, that the Cape Eastern Front, Eastern Front for the British uh, is at such a distance from England that what they're getting is distorted reportage. So the way in which she presents herself as having news value is that what you're getting is actually really bad quality news and that the good quality news, what really happened is what I'm going to say. There's a lot about so I was really struck by so this discussion of how she foregrounds the fact that she's cross-checking, corroborating a uh, number of sources that, so there's a certain layered quality to her reportage. So how, whom is she choosing from? What are her sources? How many show, sources is she cross-checking with, you know, which were not there in the daily, you know, so there's pretty much a site one soldier. Uh, so I was really struck by that and it gives her a, so, and in terms of topicality's oblique relation, which is something I took from Claire Petit's work on serial phones. So it's that they don't stop being topical, but what really qualifies as having news value to the reader in England, would I think be, sure, I mean, they would know because of having read daily newspapers, they would have an understanding of daily news as a certain kind of news value. But we're also reading other temporalities, uh, you know, sort of weekly, monthly, each of which in the reading and at the point of reading would need them to sustain a different notion of news value within that journal because they're reading this report of a present ongoing war. So for her in the US and this is the present war uh, versus uh, historical accounts or memoirs of army servicemen and things like that. 
So I, I did go into what did news value mean in a transcolonial imperial monthly. It's not just a monthly, it's also an imperial monthly. So news arriving three months late from Eastern Cape, uh, from the Eastern Cape didn't really feel as outdated as it would feel if it came from London three months late. You know? So I think there's also that uh, sense of it. But thank you so much. Such a great question. Thank you. No, thank you. That was a wonderful answer. Um, I We could clearly go on for another half hour at least, but we are at the top of the hour. Uh, for many of us, for our colleagues in India, we're at the top of the half hour. Uh, so um, again, I, I think I might write some of my questions to Deja and Mary uh, together, and folks are certainly welcome to. Um, so before we uh, say thank you to them, I just want to quickly mention uh, that our next uh, digital event will be on October 11th. Um, many of you know Leslie Housem, Leslie Housem, um, and I called it at the top of the hour a half book um, uh, launch. It's not really she has a book on Eliza Omre. She's not going to be speaking about her book so much as about things that weren't able to make it into her book that offer some um, uh, uh, conceptual questions about periodical studies. So you'll get uh, other notices, you'll register for it it's on October 11th. But now please let us thank um, Teja and Mary for really doing this wonderful format as well of a uh, book launch. So thank you. Kathy, your hand is raised if you want <laughs> you want to lower. I know it's the trouble with uh, with these. So thank you so much, Mary and Deja, and for all of you for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone, for coming and for your questions. Thank you, thank you so much. General. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Well done. Bravo, bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of love in the chats. I hope you're um, seeing the chat. I will save the chat and send it to you, Teja oh, and Mary. Um, I know it might be hard because lots of so great lovely. comments. Thank you. Thanks, so everyone. Thank you. Teja, you wrote a message to me. Thank you, everyone, for coming. So I'm going to say it out loud because <gasps> you just sent it to me. <laughs> That's oh, okay. So Teja <laughs> says, thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye. Like thank you, Preeti. Thank you. Thank you. I put the discount code for Betty Waters is dancing in the chat. So do Thank take you. advantage of that. And Mary, we'll I will throw that. I'll also throw that in the follow up email I sent to registrants because people may have missed it and all the thanks. So um, I will pull that uh, code and send it there, too. And uh, Deja, if you have a code, too, you don't have to. I will uh, add that. Yeah. To no, no, I, I, I do actually.